So, uh, so far, uh, Professor Som has discussed on uh, some of the introductory issues related to various modes of heat transfer and uh, we will next proceed uh, towards mathematically describing the equations for conduction heat transfer. That is the agenda of today. Now, why we require all this? So, uh, let us say, uh, I mean let us think about a practical problem. Let us say that uh, there is a piece of metal which is acted upon by a heat source and there is some change in temperature within the metal. Because of the change in temperature, there will be a temperature gradient and the temperature gradient will in turn dictate the microstructure and the microstructure will dictate the mechanical properties of the material. So, it is very important to analyze that how the temperature varies with position and time within the material. So, this is one example. I mean we can give many examples. Uh, I will just give another example. Let us say that there is some medical doctor who is doing surgery with a laser. So, when the medical doctor is doing surgery with a laser, what the medical doctor is essentially doing? The medical doctor is trying to say kill or destroy some tumors. So, this is an example of course, laser can be used for several medical purposes. This is just one example. So, when this is happening, then one of the big objectives is to make sure that only the diseased cells are killed, but the normal cells are not damaged. Because it is a very common side effect that after a treatment, when the disease cells are killed, the normal cells are also destroyed because of the heating effect in the surrounding tissues. And then what happens is that basically because the normal cells are also damaged, it can give rise to weak immune system of the patient and uh, as the patient may, may suffer from serious side effects of the treatment. So, now how do you know that what will be the extent up to which the effect of the laser treatment is felt? So, then you have a laser source, then you have to find out the temperature within the tissue as a function of position and time and then figure out that which are the damaged tissues uh, or which are the damaged cells, which are cells not yet damaged and one can essentially figure out a suitable parameter of the laser. For example, laser power, what should be the ideal laser power and all these things so that the correct treatment can be made. So, there are several situations in which conduction is a dominating mode of heat transfer number one and number two, it is important to find out how the temperature within the material, the material may be a physical material, it may be also a biological material whatever, the temperature within the material varies as a function of position and time. And to solve this problem, one has to look into the problem from a mathematical perspective. One can of course do experiments, but when you do experiments, it is not possible to figure out at each and every point how temperature varies as a function of position and time. But if you do numerical simulations or if you do analytical solutions, if analytical solutions are possible, then you can figure out that at each and every point how the temperature varies with position and time. Now, before going for the analytical and numerical treatment, you have to understand that what equation you should solve and we will derive that equation today that is the agenda of today's lecture. So, uh, when we are thinking of the equation that governs the temperature as a function of position and time, so the kind of equation that we are looking for is the differential equation because essentially uh, a differential equation can only give a point to point variation. Now, if you are interested about a global balance, global picture, you can use some equations which are also known as integral equations. In this particular course of conduction and convection heat transfer, we will also discuss about many situations when we will be using the integral equations, but today uh, we will start with the differential uh, form of equation for heat conduction. So, to understand that, so the uh, agenda is basically to write 
an expression, a mathematical expression that talks about energy balance. Now, energy balance is something which is very obvious and we will start with the description of energy balance, but I know that right, uh, we are having a lecture when it is quite late in the evening, raining outside, there are uh, like compelling situations which can make you feel distracted from the subject. So, if we start with energy balance principle and all those things, you may feel oh, this is not interesting. So, I will start with something which is not energy balance, but which is money balance and money balance can make you feel excited at this fag end of the day. So, we will start with balance of money rather than balance of energy. So, uh, I will start with the story of a good old day when people had to go to a bank to open a bank account. Say you have got a new, nowadays you do not have to go to a bank to open a bank account. I mean you may have several online resources to do that. The bank person can individually come to you and help you to open the bank account. But this is a good old day when we were very young or our fathers were even young. In those days uh, people had to go to the bank to open bank account. So, let us say that somebody has got a new job, he has gone to the bank to open a bank account. So, once you get a job and you open a bank account, of course, you have to deposit some money to the bank. So, when the money is deposited to the bank, your account gets activated. Now, every month your salary is being deposited in the bank account. Now, someday you have got into the bank and you realize that you have to withdraw some money from the bank. This is a good old day time, so no ATM business, you have to physically go to the bank and withdraw the money. But before withdrawing the money, you must know that you are having the correct amount of money in your bank or you have the bank balance to withdraw that money. So, to you can check your passbook and then what you do is you are withdrawing some money from that. Now, when you are withdrawing some money from that, you mentally try to do a balance. What balance? So, some money has flown in into your bank account. This is your, this black box is like a bank account. So, money in, so money in, how was money in input to the bank account? You first deposited some money and then your employer has deposited your salary in the bank account. So, money in minus money out, money out is what whatever you have withdrawn from the bank. Is it your net bank balance? This is not your net bank balance. You see your bank balance is little bit more than this. It is more than this because bank is giving you interest. So, money generated, money cannot be generated right, it is very difficult to generate money. I have never been successful in generating money in, in my life, but uh, I mean uh, money is generated because of some issues in economics which is not the agenda of heat transfer. So, we will not get into that. So, money generated, this is what is net bank balance, right. right. This is the summary of the story of money balance in a bank account. Now, think of instead of a bank account, you think of a control volume and energy transfer is taking place across the control volume. So, this is a control volume and energy transfer is taking place across this. So, when energy transfer is taking place across this, you have some energy coming in. So, this is a control volume. I believe all of you understand what is a control volume, right? A control volume is a fixed region in space across which mass and energy can flow. So, as if you were sitting with a camera, focusing your camera over this region, 
and across this region there is some transport of energy and mass. So when you do that, so instead of money in, now you can write energy in minus energy out plus energy generated. How can energy be generated? Again like it is, it is a questionable term, it is a very loose way of stating what is happening because as we all know from our school days that energy cannot be created or it cannot be de destroyed. So it is basically some mode of transfer. So what is happening? Let us say that in a system there is electrical wire and current is flowing through the electrical wire. So when current is flowing through the electrical wire, there is a heating effect because of joule heating, right, I square R. So that is something what by an example of what we mean by energy generation or in a combustion reaction, there are reactants and the reactants combine together to form a product and then there is a release of thermal energy. So that is a another example, okay, so or there may be nuclear reaction. So there are various possibilities by which you can have energy generation. So instead of bank balance now, you have net change of energy within the control volume. So energy in minus energy out plus energy generated is net change of energy within the control volume. Just it is like net change of money within the bank account, instead of money it is energy. The bank account is similar to a control volume, okay. So now because in heat transfer all things are more or less expressed in terms of a rate process, so it is often written in terms of rate of energy in minus energy out plus energy generated is equal to rate of net change of energy within the control volume, right. This is a statement of basic energy balance and believe me or not, if you have understood it correctly and if you know how to represent it mathematically, you know 50 percent of heat transfer. So, uh, we will see that how we can write this expression of balance. This is a physical, physically intuitive expression, right? Even if we uh, do not know much of a science, this is something which comes from physical intuition. In minus out plus generated equal to change. So we want to write this in terms of mathematical expressions. So this is a qualitative physical expression. Next our objective will be to write it mathematically. So we will proceed towards that. So to do that, let us say that we have a control volume like this, okay. So this control volume, so uh, let us say this is x axis. This is y axis and this is z axis. Now why we have chosen such a control volume is because we want to derive the equation in terms of the Cartesian coordinate system. But you could choose any other shape control volume. There is no restriction on the shape of the control volume. Just for simplicity of using the Cartesian system, we have taken such a control volume. <coughs> Next, what we will do is, we will account for the rate of heat transfer over here. In heat transfer, just like in mechanics, you have two types of forces. One is a surface force, another is a volumetric force or a body force. Similarly, in heat transfer, you have either surface heat transfer or volumetric heat transfer. 
So, this rectangular shaped body or control volume which has dimension say delta x along x, delta y along y. and delta z along z. Okay? Now, what we do is, we will consider all the faces. How many faces are there? You have six faces in this volume. So, over each face, we are interested to write a description of the heat transfer. And the description of the heat transfer, for example, if we consider this phase, we will represent it by a quantity which is called as heat flux, right. So, this heat flux, this is what? Rate of heat transfer per unit area normal to the direction of heat transfer. Rate means time rate that is what is expressed per unit area. So, per heat transfer per unit area normal to the direction of heat transfer per unit time. So, that is this, this is a typical uh, notation by which we write that. So, this is heat flux. So, if this is the heat flux, what is the total rate of heat transfer through this, this heat flux times the area of the shaded phase. So, what is the area of the shaded phase? Delta y into delta z. Just consider the opposite phase, this phase. We will first investigate what is happening along x and similar things will happen along y and z. So, we have considered two phases which have normal along x. Then similar two phases can be considered which have normal along y and other two phases which have normal along z. So, what is the heat flux here? So, if it is q double prime x, this is q double prime at x plus delta x, right? Same heat flux, this is at x, if this is x equal to x, this is x equal to x plus delta x. This times see this is energy in, this is energy out, right. So, similar thing from the bottom and from, from the top and from the back and from the front. I am not writing all those to make the figure clumsy. So, what I will do is I will just write one of the terms which is governing the behavior along x, similar terms will come along y and z. So, rate of energy in minus rate of energy out, this dot means rate. So, what is this? This is along x plus similar terms along y and similar terms along z. We will write those terms very soon and we will write those terms by looking into the analogy with this. Now, you see here that basically we have to write the difference between q double prime x and q double prime x plus delta x. So, what is q double prime x plus delta x? You can write it in terms of q double prime x. 
by using a Taylor series expansion, right. So, Q double prime at x plus delta x is equal to Q double prime x plus some higher order terms which involve delta x square, delta x cube like that. So, you can simplify this term and write q double prime x minus q double prime x plus delta x that is equal to this times delta y into delta z. plus higher order term, right. So, this delta x multiplied with delta y delta z becomes delta x delta y delta z. So, if this is the term along x, what will be the term along y? Similar thing. and along z also similar term. Okay. Plus higher order term of course is there. So, we have written energy in minus energy out. That means, we have written this term and this term. Then, we will write energy generated. So, for energy generated, we typically consider this as rate of energy generation per unit volume. So, what is the rate of energy generation this term, it is simply q triple prime into delta x, delta y, delta z. This is per unit volume, this is the total volume of the control volume. What is the net rate of energy, change of energy within the control volume? How do you write it? We have written the left hand side of this. Now, we are interested about the right hand side. So, how do you write the net rate of change of energy within the control volume? Yes. So, what is the in terms of thermodynamics, what is the energy within the control volume? Which form of energy is repre representative of the energy within the control volume? It is the internal energy. Internal energy is not necessarily Cp into T or Cv into T, whatever. So, we will discuss about that clearly. So, we will call internal energy. What is internal energy? How it should be described and how it should be brought in the context of this equation? We will discuss about that. So, let us say in thermodynamics, you have used a symbol of U for internal energy. In heat transfer, we will avoid that because we will preserve the symbol u for velocity because uh, we have 
a whole length of discussion on con convection where the fluid mechanics will interface with heat transfer. So there the velocity field will come. So we will not use the symbol U for internal energy, better we will use a symbol I for internal energy. So small i is the small u that you have learnt in thermodynamics for internal energy. So this is what? This is a property per unit mass. What is the mass of the control volume? The density rho into delta x into delta y into delta z, okay. So it is not this, it is the rate of change of this. So rate of change of this means this one. Very important, this is not ordinary derivative, this is partial derivative. The reason is pretty clear that when you are considering the net or net rate of change of energy within the control volume, you are fixing up the position and at a given position you are finding out how the internal energy is changing with time. So it is a rate of change with respect to time keeping the position fixed. That is why partial derivative and not ordinary derivative. The next job will be to now combine the left hand side and the right hand side. So the left hand side Because delta x, delta y, delta z all are constants, so we have taken that out of the time derivative, okay. So now see our objective is to derive a differential equation and differential equation means an equation which is valid at a point, at a point in space as well as at a given instant of time, okay. So you have to basically shrink this volume, rectangular volume to a point. How do you shrink the rectangular volume to a point? You take the limit as delta x, delta y, delta z all tend to 0. So take the limit as delta x, delta y, delta z tend to 0. Because these are all tending to 0, these are individually not equal to 0, so they, these get cancelled from both sides and the higher order term will tend to 0 as because higher order term will involve what? Either delta x square cube like that or delta y square cube like that or delta z square cube like that. So when you take these limits, that term will tend to 0. So then you are left with this equation.
Now this is a pretty generic equation. So far, we have not yet introduced the implication of conduction in this equation. Now what can be the basic modes of this heat flux? The basic modes of this heat flux may be one of the basic modes of heat transfer. So we have not committed that it is conduction. Now we will commit that it is conduction. So we will write this keeping in mind that the mode of heat transfer that we are considering is conduction. That will lead to the basic heat conduction equation. So if we write the heat flux as a function of a parameter which is directly measurable for heat conduction how can we write that? So let us say that heat flux along x. So heat flux along x, how do you write it in terms of a measurable parameter for conduction? So heat flux along x is proportional to the negative of the temperature gradient along x. This is nothing but Fourier's law of heat conduction. Now there are many situations in engineering when the Fourier's law is applied or is applicable, but there are many situations, if not many at least quite a few situations when the Fourier's law is not applicable. So, it is very important to discuss the various considerations based on which we can use the Fourier's law before simplifying the equation further. So the Fourier's law, see one of the very, this is called as a constitutive law. It somehow relates a cause with an effect. So the effect is a heat flux and what is the cause? Cause is the temperature gradient because heat always gets transported from higher temperature to lower temperature. So the positive heat flux will be along the direction of negative temperature gradient and to make an adjustment for that you have a negative sign here. So this is a cause effect type of relationship and uh, this is a linear relationship as you can see that this type of relationship is a linear constitutive behavior. That means this is linearly related to the temperature gradient. Now this assumes that we are considering a situation when physically if you create a disturbance in temperature at a point that propagates to all possible directions at infinite speed. That is the basic physical premise of the Fourier's law of heat conduction. So that means what this is something like this. Say it is a domain, let us say everywhere in the domain the temperature was atmospheric temperature. Now suddenly you have make this point 0 degree centigrade by bringing in contact with ice. So this temperature disturbance will be instantaneously propagated in all directions at infinite speed so that all points in the domain will immediately know that there is a temperature change I have to respond to the change. This message, so there is a messenger within the material which propagates the effect of temperature disturbance by virtue of heat conduction and that messenger is nothing but the thermal conductivity of the material. So in our subsequent discussions we will see that a more effective parameter to describe the efficacy of this message propagation is not thermal conductivity but thermal diffusivity.
and we will discuss about that in a moment. Now, see whenever we learn some formula, we also have to know that when it is applicable, more importantly when it is not applicable because many times when it is applicable we apply it is fine. Many times we tend to apply it when it is actually not applicable. So, when you say that we are using this Fourier's law, there are typical situations when the Fourier's law is not applicable. Let us, uh, let me again give an example of say a treatment of a biological tissue with a femtosecond laser. Say a laser with a pulse of femtoseconds, very short pulse. Now, the laser pulse will be coming, it will be on and off, on and off in a very short span of time. So, let us say the uh, medical treatment is going on with the laser, the laser is falling on the tissue for a very short period of time it is acting on the tissue then it is going off. So, what is happening is when the laser is acting on the tissue, the tissue takes some time to adjust to the change in temperature brought in by the laser. But before the tissue adjusts to itself, immediately the laser pulse is switched off and by the time it get readjusted another new pulse has come. So, that means that the, the time interval over which the change takes place is shorter than the relaxation time of the material. The material takes a time to adjust to the change. Like all of us cannot adjust to a change instantaneously, materials also do like that. So, you apply a heat transfer to the material, the material cannot instantaneously adjust its temperature to take care of that. So, it will take a little bit of time. Now, if your time duration over which you impose the disturbance is still shorter than the time, then what happens is that the temperature disturbance cannot propagate at an infinite speed, but it propagates at a finite speed. It is very similar to the manner in which a disturbance propagates through a medium and that speed you know from basic physics is known as the sonic speed. So, uh, there are uh, various possibilities when uh, the temperature disturbance within the material propagates through a propagates by a finite speed and then Fourier's law is not applicable. So, those type of situations are called as non-Fourier heat conduction. It is not within the scope of this particular course to discuss about that, but I have just brought that situation out to give you an example that we should not take it as a ritual that the Fourier's law is always valid. But we will proceed with the case assuming that the Fourier's law is valid. Now, the constant of proportionality is replaced by an equality where this equality is called as the thermal conductivity of the material. So, we have given a subscript x because thermal conductivity is a property which can vary with direction. So, if you have anisotropic, if you have anisotropic thermal conductivity, then k x, k y, k z these are all different. But most of the times we are dealing with materials for which k x, k y, k z all are same and that is uh, some constant k. So, if that be the case, then you can write Now, just out of curiosity, you might observe a very interesting thing. See, fluid mechanics and heat transfer, of course, these are two different subjects and that is why you are studying these as different courses in your curriculum. But there is a whole lot of similarity in terms of mathematical approach of fluid mechanics and heat transfer. And there are very various fundamental foundations behind that. 
when you are talking about this Fourier's law, can you think of an equivalent law in fluid mechanics? The Newton's law of viscosity, right? The Newton's law of viscosity is like for a flow in which is taking place along x and with velocity gradient along y, you write tau is equal to mu into du dy, right? So, it is like a velocity gradient related to the shear stress. Chemical engineers often call shear stress as momentum flux because the shear stress is brought about by a disturbance in momentum. Like let us say there is a flat plate and fluid is flowing over the flat plate. Because of the frictional or the uh, physical effect of no slip at the wall, what is happening is the fluid molecules at the wall are having zero velocity if the wall is having zero velocity. But the fluid molecules which are next to the wall will not directly feel the effect of the wall. But how it will know that there is a wall? There is an invisible messenger within the fluid that transmits this momentum flux or momentum disturbance and this invisible messenger is viscosity. So it is very much similar to thermal conductivity. So this viscous effect is because of momentum diffusion and thermal conduction is because of heat diffusion. Both are diffusion phenomena and you also have a similar effect in mass transfer which is called as mass diffusion and that is governed by another law called as Fick's law. So we will not come into that because mass transfer is not within the scope of our present course. Now let us say you want to solve this equation. Now are you in a position to solve this equation? See <coughs> you have temperature as one of the variables. Now here you have internal energy. So these two variables are not the same. So you must close this system <coughs> with an expression that relates temperature with internal energy. Okay. So how you relate uh, temperature with internal energy? So even from practical consideration, you must express it in terms of temperature or pressure, whatever, something which is measurable, right? If you are making experiments, then you have devices which can measure temperature, you have devices which can measure pressure. Now there is, there are devices like thermometer, but there is nothing called as internal energy meter. So experimentally, to measure something and to relate that measured parameters with what you predict from the theory, you need to have this internal energy expressed as a function of measurable parameters. What are the measurable parameters that you require? See, it depends on first of all how many, measure, how many measurable parameters are required to express internal energy, energy as a function of those parameters. How many parameters? It depends on the physical state of the system and what kind of system it is. So in thermodynamics, there is something which is called as a simple compressible substance. So a simple compressible substance is a substance for which pressure, volume, temperature changes are much more important as compared to like electrical effect, magnetic effect, other non-thermal effects. So we are mostly concerned about simple compressible substances, that is number one. Number two is we are concerned about something which is a pure substance. So a pure substance is a substance which is chemically homogeneous. So simple compressible substance and pure substance, these types of substances if we consider, then you require two independent intensive thermodynamic properties to describe the state of the system. This is known as state postulate in thermodynamics. So basically you require two independent properties. So can we write those two independent properties as temperature and pressure? So what we are trying to say is that we, if we have a simple compressible pure substance, 
we can describe any thermodynamic intensive thermodynamic property in terms of two independent intensive thermodynamic properties. So, can those two properties be temperature and pressure? Yes or no? Not always necessarily. Why? The requirement is that these two properties have to be independent. Can you describe a situation in thermodynamics when the temperature and pressure are not independent, they are dependent on each other? Change of phase, right? Let us say that liquid water is getting converted into water vapor. So, the phase change temperature and phase change pressure are dependent on each other. So, we are when we are claiming that we are writing internal energy as a function of these two, we are precluding the case of phase change. So, we are not bringing the case of phase change in the analysis. So, the internal energy we are writing as a function of temperature and pressure with an understanding that we are not addressing the problems of phase change. So, sometimes instead of internal energy we express it in terms of enthalpy. So, the enthalpy is right. This is like H is equal to U plus PV. The specific volume is 1 by density instead of U the symbol is I. Okay. So, rho H is equal to rho I plus P. So, rho I is equal to rho H minus P. So, we are basically interested to simplify this term. So, what is this del del T of rho i? That is del del T of rho h minus p. Alright. Now, I will ask you a very simple question. Can you tell what is the value of this term? Remember, we are addressing the case of pure heat conduction without fluid flow. So, just think of the continuity equation in fluid mechanics. This is the continuity equation in fluid mechanics, right? So, we are thinking of conduction that means pure conduction. That means this term is not there, flow is not there. So, this must be equal to 0.
Now we will express this enthalpy as a function of pressure and temperature. Instead of internal energy, we are writing H as a function of temperature and pressure. So we can write dH basic rule of partial derivatives. The total change is some total of the partial change due to change in temperature plus partial change due to change in pressure. By definition you know this is what? Cp, right? This is the definition of Cp. Now we can express this by using one of the TDS relationships. So in thermodynamics, you have encountered this TDS relationship, right? TDS equal to dH minus VdP. This V is 1 by the density. So in place of dH, you can write TDS plus dP by rho. Now you can see that right hand side is expressed in terms of dT, dP, left hand side there is one dP and there is a dS. So we can express dS also in terms of dT and dP because we can write entropy as a function of two measurable parameters T and P. So this will be Now this you can write in terms of other measurable parameters. See this is not a measurable parameter, entropy is not a measurable parameter. So you can write it in terms of a measurable parameter using this. This is one of the four Maxwell's relationships in thermodynamics. TDS using the TDS relationships you can derive this. You must have done this in first year physics or chemistry and then later on in thermodynamics. Okay? So T into minus del V del T at constant pressure. Now if you compare this with this, so left hand side this has dt and right hand side this has dt, then what is this? This is Cp, this is T into this, so this is Cp by T, right? The left hand side and right hand side coefficient of dt must be the same, right? You follow this, right? This is Cp, this is T into this, so this also should be Cp, so this must be Cp by T. Okay. So now we can write, if you now equate the coefficients of dP, so
So if you equate the coefficients of dp on the left hand side, the coefficient of dp is here minus t del b del t then plus 1 by rho and the right hand side this is the coefficient of dp, right. So you can write dh equal to cp dt this is the contribution due to pressure this is the total change in enthalpy this is the change in enthalpy due to temperature and this is the change due to pressure Now look into this expression. So rho del H del T we will use this term. So the first term will be rho Cp What we have done? We have basically written this as delta H is equal to Cp delta T plus this into delta P divided both sides by delta T and taken the limit as delta T tends to 0. So that will give rise to this equation. Okay. This is T time, not temperature. Now this first term will get cancelled with this term, right? This is del P del T, this is minus del P del T. What is this second term? This remember this is del V del T at constant pressure, right? You have a term which is volumetric expansion coefficient beta. Volumetric expansion coefficient is change in volume per unit volume for each degree change in temperature. That is what is mathematically written in this form. So you can write this as beta into V, where this beta, what is the name of this beta? Volumetric expansion coefficient. So this will be rho Cp ok. 
ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಇಕ್ವೇಶನ್ ನಾವು ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ರೈಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆಸ್ so what we have done we have replaced this del del t of rho i with this expression okay in place of del del t of rho i we have written rho cp del t del t minus beta t del p del t and that beta t del p del t we have brought in the right hand side so this equation is a general equation for heat conduction now typically in undergraduate texts we are interested for heat conduction in a solid and for solids the volumetric expansion coefficient this is very very small not only that you do not have a pressure like quantity varying with time within a solid so for all practical purposes for a heat conduction within the solid this term goes away typically when you see derivations of this equation in any book you will find this term is not there but we should not presume that and we should start from a consideration that yes internal energy or enthalpy could themselves vary with both temperature and pressure because solids are not pressure sensitive so the eventually it boils down to only temperature dependence and not pressure dependence so for heat conduction within a solid you are basically getting this equation without this term and this is known as the heat conduction equation so this equation involves temperature as a function of position and time and this is in in terms of partial differential equation theory this is a like a initial boundary value problem where you prescribe the condition at time equal to zero and based on that initial condition the solution will evolve as a function of x y and z depending on the boundary conditions so we need to discuss about what are the possible boundary conditions associated with this equation and then we will work out a few very simple problems to illustrate the use of this equation i will not show you how to solve this equation because that will be the agenda of the subsequent lectures but i will just show you how to simply use this equation to uh, address heat conduction problems so we will take a short break of about of about 5 minutes and then we will take another half an hour typically to complete the boundary conditions for this and uh, as a tutorial work out one one or two or three simple problems to illustrate this concept